Hello, everyone. This is your lovely Vice President, Edward Tamijian. Y'all know me from my published paper on the origin of evil, and I'm here with our member at large for Internet Infidels, Dr. Jason Thibodeau. He's written many scholarly works for us. And then again, once again, for the fourth time, we'll be interviewing the famous ex-Cuban spy, now physicist, Bill Gady. And so I'm going to begin with my first question as usual, and then I'll have him expound on his elaborative interpretation of physics. So for our first question, Bill, we have, in our last interview, you claim that the atoms that are usually connected by the electromagnetic threads usually can't pass through each other, but under certain circumstances they can. Care to elaborate on those exceptions? Okay, there are really no exceptions. The threads, let, let me make it clear right now, forever and ever, okay? The threads, the ropes, they do go through each other, okay? They can pass through each other, but there's a, uh, you can imagine these threads are extremely, extremely unimaginably thin, and there's a friction that we would not be able to detect in our world, in our macro world. So they do go through each other. Why do we say that they go through each other without touching, without, you know, without interference, without any friction? Well, we say that because that's the easy way to explain things. That's the only reason. But in the book, I make it absolutely clear that there is a tiny, a tenuous friction. OK, now, how does that friction come into being when when does mother nature create real touch uh, macro world touch our world touch okay that's what we need to understand not so much what happens at the uh we can call it the uh plank length or below you know uh, something unimaginably thin at that level there's a tiny friction and we can say it just goes through without touching it does touch but where does Mother Nature invent touch? When does the thread, which has this intangible for our level uh, friction, when does it really become macro world touch? That's the question, okay? So let's get that in the right context. Okay, you need two things. You need aggregation. You get, need many, many, many gazillions of threads. That's the first one. And the second <laughs> one is that uh, you need uh, speed if you want to go through. In other words, if you go very slow, it has no problem. But when you go very fast, it's going to go right through as if nothing were there. So mm -hmm. it's a question of speed and aggregation. Those are the two factors. Now, what I do, because I don't want to take your whole day to explain in every case, it's in the book. It's already written. I'm not saying this so that people buy the book. I'm just saying it is in the book for those people who are interested. Mm -hmm. We go through different cases. Now, I, I showed you a video. You can show it a little later when you get into the video phase where I show three examples. One of them is going to be uh, what is called as neutron bombardment. Okay, You throw a Newton, which is what uh, Rutherford, Ernest Rutherford, did in 1919 to discover the proton. Okay, he concluded he concluded that the atom is mostly empty space, and that's been uh, repeated even up to today. People say, "Oh, the atom is mostly empty space." Not under the rope hypothesis. Under the rope hypothesis, there is gazillions of threads in there. Okay, but but if an atom is, is a, if a neutron is sent directly against the atom, right? If it's sent directly against it, it'll bounce back, which is what Rutherford said. It was like shooting, you know, a hand grenade, uh, bombs or whatever against tissue and having it bounce back. Why? Because you have suddenly an atom that hits the center of the atom, and that's when it bounces back. But if it's a little off to the side, it'll just go through. Why? Because what you have is, and you got to look at the model of the uh, uh, rope mod atom, right? And you will see that it's mainly, you know, threads that just go through threads. And if it's at great speeds as they shoot them during the neutron bombardment uh, experiment, well, then it has no problem going right through as if nothing were there. That's why Rutherford, according to us, incorrectly uh, uh, concluded that what you have there is empty space. 
It's not empty space. It's that it doesn't touch at that great speed. Only It, it will only touch if it hits straight on uh, the center of the atom, the neutron against the atom. Then it'll bounce back. And so very few atoms bounce back. And that was what surprised him. He says, you know, when it hits the center, the proton, it'll bounce back. When it hits a little to the side, it goes right through. And he did that. He did that the atom was mostly empty space. That's one scenario. Let me give you another scenario. Here you have two magnets, OK? Uh, very easy. Uh, uh, these are, uh, you know, uh, refrigerator magnets, right? And you can see that, you know, they stick together. Very simple, right? In between that, we don't see anything. We can't touch anything here, OK? There's nothing yeah. there as far as we're concerned. Us, us humans, you know, us yeah. macro world human beings, our macro world world, <laughs> right? But there, uh, uh, both Faraday and uh, Maxwell, uh, you know, they concluded that there is something there. We just can't see it or touch it. It's some exotic matter. That's what they referred to. OK, there is something here that we cannot see or touch. And that produces the attraction or repulsion in the case, you know, you have positive against positive, negative against negative. OK, so there is something there that we cannot see or touch. What we need to do, if we're going to be real scientists, real physicists, is imagine we cannot uh, run an experiment to determine what's in there because we cannot see or touch it. We cannot use hands or eyes. We need to imagine, we need to visualize what Mother Nature could have in this region between the two magnets. Okay? And what we're saying is what you have is gazillions of threads coming out of the atoms of each one of the magnets and they're swirling around. You know, they're turning around, they're uh, going round and round. If they go in opposite directions, one clockwise, the other one counterclockwise, right? Then they'll hit each other and push each other away. We have repulsion. If we turn one of the magnets 180 degrees, exactly 180 degrees around, now they're both going in the same direction. When, one, when the threads of one magnet come down, the other one come up, you have this situation. And what you have is exact uh, you know, attraction. Why? Because you have gazillions, uh, maybe I'm very uh, liberal, maybe it's more than gazillions of threads. You have aggregation at great speeds and there is a friction there you know, constantly, and that's what brings the two magnets together. The closer they are together, the more threads that participate and the faster they come together. So if you get two magnets and you pull, pull them apart, right? The closer you get them together, the faster they will go. Why? Because the atoms are closer together, meaning the threads inter, uh, intervening in this, uh, in this interaction are closer are there are more threads the closer they are together and the you know and then you get the speed you get the closer the faster and faster approach of one magnet to another and so those are two situations in which i exemplify uh under the rope model how you can conceptualize uh attraction with magnets and why in the case of neutron bombardment you have this situation where under certain circumstances the atoms bounce back and under others, they go right through as if there was nothing to stop them. It's got to do with speed and aggregation. The third one is that if you look at my atom, right, it's a star that's encapsulated by a membrane, and that membrane is made out of threads. So what you have is that membrane, that's uh, which we call the electron shell, correctly shell, not a bead, but a shell that encapsulates the entire atom, you know, and it's made, it's weaved out of gazillions of threads. And that's when you have a surface and now you have an atom that comes against another atom. And now, yeah, they can hit, they can, they produce what we call touch. You know, in other words, they're, they're bouncing, they hit, they, they have this uh, uh, touch property. Uh, if, if we didn't have the aggregate of threads, they would not be able to touch. A rope will go right through one another rope without any problem because they don't have the property of touch until you have aggregation. And hopefully we don't have speed because if you have speed also, it'll go right through. So these are factors that we analyze in the book, right? In more detail, 
for people who are interested in that subject because everybody asks the question, how about touch? Yeah. And what nobody ever decided is that you have to define the word touch. What does touch mean? No one has ever defined the word touch. And we say, well, you know, again, I think I explained this. Uh, the zero distance between you objects. Guys. Yeah. Uh, you know, I touch my finger and you say, well, I'm touching my finger. No, you don't. You haven't touched your finger because under in physics, in ordinary speech, you have, but not in physics. Why? Because when I do this, I can pull my finger away. It hasn't become part of the other finger. The only way you can get real, absolute, you know, genuine, super duper touch is if two objects become one. One becomes another one. Uh, so it's uh, two objects become one. Now you have touch. As long as they continue, if, as long as I have space between the two fingers, and I do at this moment, I don't have touch. There, there's space between them. <laughs> so there's no touch. And so you have to define the word touch before you can uh, talk about crossing, you know, um, uh, going across something else, right? So those are, it's important to have the definition. And then as far as, you know, whether it touches or not, or goes across, you have to look at speed and aggregation of threads. Okay, that's in general terms. And the book says it in much more detail. Gotcha. All righty. Thanks for answering that question. And then, um, do we kind of just, I think it would be better to just go through the slides. Um, I know um, I'll kind of be like jumping ahead a bit insofar as my questions, but I think, you know, um, just addressing what's on the slides a little bit, and then uh, after we address what's on um, the three slides, we'll just go right into the videos. Does that sound good, Bill? Yeah, okay. Let me, let me give you maybe an introduction that will put the matter in the proper context, okay? Okay. One of the big issues being is two, really three, <laughs> uh, issues being heavily investigated by all mathematical physicists, okay? What do they write up, uh, about today? Well, they write specifically about three things. They write about black holes, dark matter, and dark energy. If you go to the ArcSiv, you know, the uh, where the people publish their uh, uh, pre-publications, and then later on, even to if you go to Science Magazine and uh, Nature and all these others uh, where they publish formally, right? Well, if you go to any of these sites, what you will find is the following. You'll find that they deal with dark energy, dark matter, and black holes. Those are very hot topics today. Everybody writes about them. Okay, what's the issue? The issue is that in none of those cases, none of them, you won't find a single paper ever written in the last 100 years where they illustrate what they're talking about. They talk about equations, yes. They talk about what they measured, yes. They talk about what they see out there in the sky, in the night sky, especially the astronomers. You will never see a physical object being illustrated <clears throat> in any paper. Why? Because mathematical physicists believe that physics is about math. It's about equations. It's about measurement. And we're saying, look, uh, we're missing something very important because we don't know what gravity is after 10,000 years. Not a single person in mathematical physicists not Einstein, not Stephen Hawking, not Newton, no one, none of them were able to explain to you a mechanism of how ma magnet of uh, how gravity works. And all these uh, things like dark matter uh, and black holes, especially those two, it's related to gravity, to mass. We're saying uh, those, neither one of those two have anything at all to do with mass or with gravity. So we take a totally different view from the establishment. The establishment says it's mass and gravity, and we're saying it has nothing to do with mass or gravity. It's a magnetic phenomenon, especially a um, uh, uh, galactic magnetic phenomenon, galac uh, the galactic field. And uh, we'll see that in a minute in, the, uh, in some of the videos. Hopefully they came out okay. And this is the issue. The issue is they cannot illustrate their mechanism because let's concede. Let, I mean, let's go all, all in their side on their uh, uh, best case scenario. Let them have what they say. They say, look, it's mass of a black hole, infinite mass, runaway mass, whatever you want to call it. And it's moving this star that's going to orbit Right, it's going to orbit this black hole, which they can't see. They say it's orbiting some kind of center, and they conclude, they infer 
that in that center, there's runaway mass. What you have is tons of mass in actually zero volume because they're talking about a singularity, which has no volume, no size, no diameter, no shape, no nothing. Okay, but it's got this infinite mass. Fine, let's concede it. I mean, I'll just go all the way and say, let's concede it. What is the mechanism? How does mass, which is a mathematical concept, move a star thousands of miles away? What is the mechanism? I want to see the mechanism. To say that mass moves a, a star, you're talking about a mathematical concept. They have not produced a mechanism. And that's where we have a problem. They cannot illustrate what they're saying. They just say it's mass and the equation is okay. Okay, great. If, if that's what you say, it's fine. Show me the show me the picture. You know, if you say, Bill, explain to me how a car works, okay? Uh, uh, you know, I'm not going to talk to you about mass and energy and force. I'm going to say, look, there's uh, gasoline. It goes through a pipe, goes to the carburetor, you know, makes a piston. That's how I would explain it to you. I'm not going to talk about mathematical concepts. I'm going to talk to you about physical objects. They can't do that with their with their uh, black hole uh, or dark matter or any of those. And so uh, I what I've shown you, some of the videos that I sent you have to do with the mechanism of, you know, why stars, like in the case of dark matter, why stars at the edge of a galaxy do not fly away? I mean, what prevents a, a star at the edge of a galaxy from flying away? See, there you see it. For example, uh, I hope that's on, you can see that online now. Oh, yeah. Uh, we all what, see did, it. Uh, what you see there, look, what you see there, this is dark matter. This is a picture or a, uh, a notion of what they have of dark matter. You have a galaxy and they start the, um, the coordinates there, you know, the number lines, they start them at the center of the galaxy, right? And you can see the farther away distance right at the bottom, right? The farther away a star is, right? You can see the speed, the faster it goes. So there's more speed the farther away it is. That's not the case with Pluto running around the uh, solar system. Mercury runs a lot faster, which is closer to the sun than Pluto, which is so far away. Okay, so you got uh, you got a problem here. You got to explain why this is the case. Why don't stars at the edge of the galaxy, why don't they fly away? And why do they travel faster than those on the inside? They cannot explain that. So how did they explain it? Or, you know, quotations there. How did they resolve this problem? They said they poured a bunch of Ks, kilograms there, that you can <laughs> see, uh, by hand. It's ad hoc. They just put a bunch of kilograms. They said, if we pour all these kilograms, all these tons or whatever, pounds on the outside, then we can make it work. Then we can, we can show why these stars are attracted inwards. Yeah, but then the question is first, why are the kilograms on the outside of a galaxy? Why aren't they between the Earth and the Moon? Because if you put more kilograms, these dark matter between the Earth and the Moon, gravity would not work the way it works in, the, in our you know, region of the world, right? That's the first problem. The second one is, okay, okay, put kilograms. I don't care. You want to put kilograms? You want to put tons, pounds? You know, put them in there. No problem. Tell me the mechanism. How does kilograms, which is a mathematical concept, compel a star to remain faithful to the center of the galaxy? And they cannot do that. And uh, I, I think it's the next one, uh, Ed, there. Uh, I'm not sure it's a video thing. No, oh, no it's another yeah, one. Bro. It's the rope hypothesis. Uh, no, it's another one where, I, where I show that a galaxy, it's the spider, says something about spider. Okay. Well, we showed spider, all the pics, so we you can. See one that says the word "spider" there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're done with the pics. So now let's go to what you gave me. All right. See. Okay. It shows you. Uh, okay, well, let's just. Not it's this. one that shows, it, it's got the wording spy, uh, spider web or something like that. Okay. All right. So you now you all, you, you all can see my screen, right? Yeah, Jason? I can see. At least okay. I can see it. See? Now, what they say, they put a black hole there to show why a star rolls around nothing. So what they see really is, if you start that one again, 
you'll see the okay. star rolling around nothing. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, the white star. Okay, you just go in circles around nothing. What they do is they by hand put what is known as a black hole in there. Okay. Okay. But then the question is, if that's the case, <laughs> you know uh, what they're doing is just putting mass. They're saying, oh, there's a lot of mass there. Okay, I'll put the mass. I'll concede it. So what? So you put mass. What's the mechanism? I cannot explain a mechanism with a mathematical concept. And that's where the whole problem is. And so the question is whether this black hole thingy, right, has any validity whatsoever. Okay, we're saying it's got nothing to do with mass. But if you put the other one, uh, when, uh, uh, when that says web or spider web or something like that. Yeah. That there? Um, if, you the, if you can put that one there. Not that one. Not this one, the ball. Nope. When it's a spider web or something like that. Oh, okay. Now I can see the names. Magnet water, star threads. Not star when threads. Spider web, web okay. spider. <laughs> touch, we got touch. Oh, I think this is what you were talking about last time about um, the aggregation and the atoms. So, yeah, yeah, that's a summary yeah, yeah. of oh, that. Yes. So people, yeah, so when Bill was talking about like how, for how magnets attract, when the ropes go like this way, if you see like how the magnets, uh, you can see how they attract. Yeah, it's kind of hard to see it because I haven't zoomed in enough, but if you look in deeply enough, you can see the, like, the threads kind of like going like that. So that that's um, talking about um, how the magnets attract, according to Bill Gates' view. And then we have the ball of yarn, which is the atom. And then, um, yeah, with fast, he was talking about aggregation. So that's that one. Okay. And then you see the so one that says spider web. I'd like to okay. see that because that'll result in yeah. dark matter for sure. Yeah, galaxy. So we got magnet, galaxy, galaxy spider web. Yeah, put that one on there. Okay. Oops. This. There you go. I don't see, see it? it yet. No, not yet. You know, you know, it yeah. says you are sh you are sh screen sharing. Hmm. <laughs> hey, uh, Ed, you might need to stop the share and then start it again with the new thing. I'm not yeah. sure, but try that. Okay. All right. All right. Uh. Da -da -da. Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, this is this is the one. All right. I mean, I have them. I got them all set up. It's just, hmm. I think maybe this this will do it. Da, 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 da. I have to click on it. I don't know. To click on it manually. All right. Uh, here we go. Okay. So. Basic. Portion. Screen. Okay, can you see? Can you see my save screen? Okay. Okay. No, but not the not the video. Yeah, 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 yeah. I just want to make sure you see that because then I can get yeah, I yeah. can get the spider web thing. Okay. You should be able to see this. can't make that bigger? Oh, okay, there we go. There yeah. we go. All right. We got and it. Look, what, what, we're saying, what we're saying is that all stars are physically connected as if you were put a, a spider web on a galaxy. So every star is connected because every atom in the universe is connected to all others. That's what we're saying. So when a, a galaxy rotates, it's like a platform. That's the reason stars don't fly out of a, a galaxy because they're all tied to all others. Okay, so it's like if you were to put a spider's web on top of a galaxy, that's how a galaxy rotates. It's like a merry-go-round, like a carousel. You know, the whole thing, the whole platform turns as a single piece. So now you can explain why the stars on the outside travel the same speed or a little faster than ones on the inside because it all turns at the same time. Uh, that's something else. All right. We, we haven't gotten okay. there yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, now I have, it's like, okay, here we go. Like when I solve one problem, another problem happens. All right, but I, I got it now. Oh, what, what other one do you want me to show, Bill? We got, oops. Well, no, okay. That, 
the first one, what I showed you, okay, this is what a galaxy really looks like here. Okay, if you can set that in I'll motion. This. Okay, so a galaxy not only uh, turns around as a platform, but it's got this magnetic field, which are gazillions of threads that come out of the atoms that form the stars that form the galaxy. So you have these threads coming out and, you know, so uh, and uh, cover the whole galaxy. And what you see there in the center are the jets that the, the mathematicians confused for uh, black hole jets. Those are the jets. The jets are the threads of the uh, uh, magnetic field that go around and, you know, just uh, go around the galaxy, uh, out the uh, center and down the sides. And if you go to the next one, which I yeah. think is the one that shows the, uh, uh, the um, no, not this one. There's one there that shows, well, this is, uh, it's good to show that one, the one, uh, no, the previous one. Okay, magnet. No, 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 another one. Magnet. I guess you put well, this, this one up to kind of show. Shows here, what this shows here is what a magnetic field is. A magnetic field has something that is physical, which we say are the threads. You can see the, the what, what you're seeing here is uh, um, there are iron filings that are thrown in the water. They're on the platform of, of the water, right? And they suddenly put mm -hmm. a magnet in there and you can see that the magnet is collecting each one of the iron filings one by one. So it's pulling out, something is pulling them one by one. You don't see, they don't all come out at the same time. This is in slow motion, okay? And so what happens is there's something swinging around the magnet, pulling each magnet, each iron filing towards the magnet. And that's what uh, Maxwell was saying. There's something in motion in the region we call a field. What you need to identify is not the word field. What you need to identify is what is moving inside a field. And so mm -hmm. what we're saying is these are the threads that are moving around, pulling the the iron filings one by one towards the magnet. And you can see that when you do uh, filings underwater. Okay, so we're saying there's something uh, moving in there. Those lines are forced. They are uh, actually physical threads. Here you see, oh, oh leave it there. Ah. <laughs> no. Star, star. The one you just showed. Okay, here. Uh, no, this one. <laughs> You're right. moving too fast. No, previous one. Well, here you see my model, okay. which is we're saying that uh, a charged particle has this magnetic field around it, and when you put it in a magnetic field, which are the ones on the sides, right? What you're seeing is uh, the threads of the magnetic field moving the threads of the charged particle. That's why a charged particle moves in circles, because you have these threads coming down on the sides, and you have the threads of the magnet of the charged particle, right? That is floating within the gazillions of threads that are coming through its sides. So we're saying you have a physical object, which is the thread. It's not like this is a ghost, and you can't say, well, it's the field. Well, what is the field? Field it says nothing. Field is a region of numbers of, of how much strength the field has. In other words, that's all a field is. What we're showing here is the physical mechanism. We're saying that the threads are what comprise the field, okay? And that's what happens in a uh, galaxy as well. The galaxy has these threads, physical threads moving around, and an object such as a charged a, a, a star is a charged object. It's got its own field. And, it's, and the magnetic field of the entire galaxy is going to move that star around because the threads are inter, uh, interacting with the threads of the, like here, you see, ah, there, ah, don't go somewhere, stay there. Okay, run that. You see a charged ball in a magnetic okay. field on the lower right-hand side. But what you see here is the magnetic field of the galaxy. And you see uh, there's a star example. In fact, that's a star example from Cygnus uh, 1, which is one of the, they claim the first black hole they discovered. You see a star going around nothing. Why? Because we're saying the star is a charged object. It's got its own magnetic field and it's interacting with the galactic magnetic field, which is 
doing what it's doing on the charged particle on the lower right. You have the magnetic field, the big magnetic field, which is of the galaxy, moving a charged object, uh, charged object such as a star, and moving it around as well. That's why the, the star is moving around nothing because there is nothing in that orbit, in the center of that orbit. What it is, is the magnetic field of the galaxy that's moving the star around like if it were, you know, uh, a little ball. That's what's happening. That's our model. We're saying that's what's happening. That's why a star moves around nothing. Yeah. It also has, by the way, the ability to uh, flay the uh, skin of the uh, star, right? You know, a star has gases on the outside, right? And so you have this magnetic field uh -huh. of the galaxy, which is enormous, right? And it's just flaying its skin. It's just pulling some of that gas out. Here you have two galaxies, and they could be doing the same thing. Maybe a star that is running around very fast, around nothing, could be in a region where two galaxies with a magnetic threads of two galaxies are impinging on that region. So these are different gotcha. things that need to be inspected and uh, investigated. But we're saying it's got to do with something and physical. I Hopefully it's got to do with something. We, we're saying it's threads. It's not field. It's not mass. It's not concepts. It's threads. Okay. Now we're talking physics. Yeah. I think a question people might have for you if is um, if someone or something goes inside any of these black holes, will they go into a parallel universe or no? Or will they just be destroyed to smithereens? Well, uh, let me tell you something about parallel universes, uh, Ed. One of the problems we have with parallel universes is that the word universe, we have to define what a universe is. And we say that a universe includes matter and uh, space. Space is nothing, that which doesn't have shape. Matter is that which has shape, you know, all, all the components of matter. So what you have is matter and space. How do you separate space, which is nothing, from another universe? What does the universe, how do we separate one universe from another if they share the same space? All we can talk about is matter. We can say, look, the matter here is separated from the matter there. That we can talk about. We cannot talk about universes because universe includes space and every universe hopefully has space. How do you separate nothing from nothing? Oh, that's the issue. <laughs> and so here, what we're showing is that uh, in this case here is that every star is a charged object. And a charged object means it's got this magnetic field around it. Our sun has it, all stars probably have it. And uh, so that's what the galactic field is. The galactic magnetic threads are going to interact with a star's magnetic thread and move it around like you move around a charged particle in the lab. In the lab, you can do this experiment. You can throw a charged particle and it'll go around in circles that we showed a minute ago. Okay, so there's nothing mysterious about this. We, we have experience with this stuff. Yeah, that's, All right, that's a star. Say. Star has a magnetic field, but they don't know what a magnetic field is. They just say oh, it's got a magnetic field. But no, the magnetic field is hopefully something physical, and we're saying it's threads. Those are the uh, lines of force that uh, Faraday discovered or identified. Oh, oh top view. Yeah, I'll show this one one more time. All right. So, um, and I think a lot of people when they see videos have like, there's like, a, there's sometimes there's usually objections to them. And I think an objection someone might come up with that you could answer on here is um, you say, and I actually was con a little confused the last time you brought it up, but you said, so you say the ropes that connect the two atoms you say the way you get out of how they don't tangle because it's like you know when the object when a, when a gravity works on an object you know it just falls downwards and like you know you don't tangle the ropes you don't see anything like gravity working like that so then your way to solve the entanglement issues to say the ropes pass through each other because of the material they're made out of they just it's just they're just they're three-dimensional they're real but they can pass through each other but then you say so they can pass through each other when it comes to the magnets and how, uh, you know, there's, I guess, the aggregation that, like, ha 
like allows them to touch and like you know hit each other so they can connect so how can you have the ropes be able to pass through each other but then they're able to contact each other right and then that's like my they point. just my point, my point first uh let, let's get the right context here ropes are not what happens in magnetism we have to differentiate threads from ropes okay <laughs> and people yeah. get them confused what's swinging around in in a magnetic field you know like this we're talking about threads when we talk oh, about uh for example ma uh, gravity right we're talking about ropes we're saying there's uh you know you got something like this maybe uh a little rope there okay uh, that's a rope, two twine mm -hmm. threads. And we're saying that if you have two um, atoms at each end, right, we can explain attraction because we have a physical mechanism, a physical mediator, I'm sorry, uh, that can serve to produce pull. You know, pull can only be done with a physical mediator. You cannot do pull without one. And no one has ever figured out that you can do, you know, that uh, you can do pull uh, without without some elongated mediator between two atoms. How do you do that? I mean, you can't throw stones, particles, you know, discrete particles from one atom to another and expect one to attract another. There's no way you can explain that with particles. You can explain it only with an elongated type of uh, mediator. And so we're saying when you have uh, two objects and they're full of atoms, every atom over here is attached to every atom over there physically through ropes now we can understand why if the atoms come uh, the objects come closer and closer together the shorter the distance the uh ropes fan out right imagine uh, just for a second if you have them at infinity two objects you know one on this side of the universe the other one on the other side of the universe well all the ropes that attach those two objects will form a single coaxial a single line almost, because you're talking about extreme distances. Now you bring them together, right? Closer and closer, closer together, moon and the earth, asteroid and the moon, whatever you want to, whatever scenario you want to con contemplate. Now they're, they're closer together, what happens? All the atoms from this object are attached to all the atoms in this object. One, one atom from here to every atom here, one atom here to every atom over here. Okay, let's get that part straight. And so as they come together, the ropes fan out because of distance. Newton's uh, uh, equation, you know, distance squared. And so it's an inverse relation. The closer they are, the, uh, the faster they come together. Why? Because the uh, ropes are fanning out uh, exponentially, you know, as they come together. And so what happens, they come faster and faster and faster together until, you know, the asteroid hits the earth or whatever. Okay, so... Uh, the mechanism for gravity is ropes. But when we're talking about magnets here, you know, now we're talking about threads. We're saying that threads are swinging around, okay? So I want to differentiate gravity from magnetism. That's the first one. One deals with ropes, the other one deals with threads. And, and then again, in the case of magnets, uh, we're saying that there is a tiny friction between two threads, but it's something we would... <laughs> not even be able to measure. We're talking about something impossibly uh, that you can't even get to. All you can say is, look, when we have many threads, gazillions of threads, now that friction uh, has a bearing because now you have not only speed, but you have this, um, you know, uh, many threads in interacting with each other. And now you do have a uh, touch for the first time because now you're not talking about one thread going through another. You're talking about gazillions of threads going through another and you have a wall of threads. Now you can produce touch, which is what, you know, the threads between here sense. We cannot sense them, but okay. they sense themselves. They, okay. they, they can sense each other. Okay. So That's when a bunch of, when a lot of ropes come together and hit threads. a bunch of, Threads, so, okay, threads. Gonna, okay, because they're okay. The ropes made out of two threads: the electric and magnetic thread. Okay, yeah. so a bunch of but those are nomenclatures. Those are just to be uh, the the. Keep in mind, uh, Ed, that we use the word electric thread and magnetic thread just to be consistent with tradition. That's how they label them. Instead of field, we call them threads. Field is a concept. 
Thread is an object. You can't use the word field in science. Field is an irrational term because it's a mathematical term that's converted, that's been converted, reified, you know, turned into a, uh, an object. That's where the irrationality is of the word field. Thread okay. is is a thread. Th this is a thread, you know. Uh, uh, this is an right, I hope this is that. So when that's a bunch a thread. of threads come together and hit a bunch yeah. of other threads that come together, that's how there's touch because there's so many of them. That's what you're right. saying. Because okay. if you had only one thread go through another or rope through another, uh, it would just go through it. There's nothing there. Right. There's a tiny friction that we would not even be able to measure. But when you have tons of threads, now, oh. you know, you have touch. Suddenly All you right. have uh, uh, our huh. macro world touch. You know, Mother okay. Nature, she knows it's touch even at her level. But for us, <laughs> we only see touch at our level. And, and that's when we say, hey, you need tons of threads. And then, yes, you can see, uh, you can visualize some invisible spirit there, you know, that's pulling the, uh, the uh, two magnets uh, together. Gotcha. All righty, Bill. So before you conclude, um, I'll just have uh, Jason come on and maybe give one or two uh, questions or objections he might have to your view or comments. Uh, so, yeah, take it away, Jason. Any yeah. comments, comments, objections? Yeah. <laughs> uh, all my questions are about dinosaurs. <laughs> no. Well, not for this. <laughs> he even texted Sorry. me, and I was like, "Now nah, I want to talk about physics." And it, it oh, was, I know, I my know. life with Fidel Castro. Yeah, we'll talk about I'm, that. I'm joking. I'm completely joking. Okay. Um, <laughs> you, you, uh, you, I bet mean, no, I mean, you really want to just talk about the dinosaurs, whether birds or dinosaurs. But yeah, we'll, we'll say that no, for I, another segment. We'll just I keep did, this no, about I the, the, the ropes. No, no, the ropes. I just, I just. I just wanted to say that. I, I didn't want to talk about it. I just to say that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so I do have some questions about the threads and that maybe that'll lead down a chain to a concern about the intuitiveness of your picture. But so my first question is, what are the what are the threads made of? Are the threads and ropes made of the same thing, if that makes sense? Yeah, well, uh, it's a question a lot of people ask. They, and, and let me tell you, let me put it in the right context here, Jason. Th this is the issue. You go into quantum mechanics. So let's look at quantum mechanics first. They say, uh, look, well, we discovered the muon. What the hell is a muon? Well, if you break the electron, you'll find a muon. If you smash it hard enough, then you'll end up with a muon. Okay. And then a pion and who knows what else. Okay, so they have all these particles, and they say, okay, what is the muon made of? And they say, look, give me another billion dollars, we'll build a bigger collider with more energy, and we'll tell you what it's made out of. Okay, so it turns out the muon is now made out of charties. We, we've invented the charty particle. Okay, so now it's made out of charties. Okay, what is the charty made out of? Well, the, give me a billion dollars more, and I'll bring a make a bigger collider, I'll tell you what the charty is made of. And they do that and they say it's made out of Johnny's. And so they keep on and on and on. And it's like, you know, you peel the onion and you never get to the center of the onion. Why? Because the onion is always made out of some other stuff. And so quantum mechanics is already designed or conceptualized to be an uh, eternal theory. You know, it's job security for all these people because they, all they're doing is saying, well, if you break it up, you end up with these other particles and we'll just give them a new name and we get a Nobel Prize and then the, let the other generation worry about what that's made out of. That's not the way it works. Mother Nature, uh, you know, somewhere the buck has to stop, okay? And what we're saying is the following. All there is in all of space is, let me show you an example here, is a single thread. You know, ah, let's see how to do it. That's all there is. A single thread. Okay. The single thread is what is known as an elementary or fundamental entity. What does that mean? It means that it's not made of anything other, uh, anything else. And it's it's not made of any parts. It's made of a single piece and it makes up everything else. So the buck stops there. In other words, 
The thread is what comprises all matter in the universe. There's a single closed loop thread in the entire universe that makes up all the atoms, which are connected to all other atoms through a pair of twine threads of the same thread that makes up all the matter in the universe. In other words, if we were to untie every atom in the universe, every rope that connects them in the universe, we would end up with a single thread in the entire universe. We're not, we won't end up with a bunch of discrete particles as uh, quantum mechanics and general relativity proposed and string theory for that matter. In other words, mathematical physicists. We're saying there's a single thread in the entire universe that weaves all the atoms which are connected by pair of twine threads of the same thread to another atom which is made out of the same thread. So everything is made out of the same thread and the thread is not divisible. The thread is made out of a single piece and you cannot break it, you cannot tear it, okay? So that's our assumption, that's our hypothesis. And from there, we build everything else. We're saying, look, the buck stops here. The elementary entity is known as the single thread makes up all the atoms which are connected by ropes, which are a pair of twine threads going from one atom to another. They're not connected. It's all a single piece. It goes through the atom, goes to another rope, to another atom, to another rope, to another atom, and so on down the line. In other words, all atoms in the universe are made of one thread. They're all connected to each other because we're talking about a single entity that is floating in what? In empty space, which is that which has no shape. That's the that's the starting point. That's our okay. Hypothesis. Yeah, yeah, that makes that makes sense. Um, okay, so then I guess I'm not exactly clear on ropes and threads because, but um, what? So my question has to do with why do certain objects like magnets attract each other according to one set of descriptions or fundamental laws, if you like, right? Or what? Yeah. But then everything else that's got mass is, attracts and operates at a, according to a different set of laws, right? So there's um, so so uh, you know magnets stick together, but my hands don't stick together, right? So why is gravity weaker than magnetism? I mean, so what's the yeah? So I don't then maybe that's just the way to put it. Why is gravity why are these different and why is gravity weaker than magnets? Mag if it's all threads, why is why are they different? Well. Uh uh, the way I look at it is the following, uh, Mother Nature, Father Universe, whoever you believe in, God, you know, it doesn't matter, the devil. <laughs> uh, we have two systems in the universe. One is known as electromagnetism, the other one known as gravity. So we have these two mechanisms. The gravitational mechanism is using ropes. The farther away the objects are, the ropes all become a single coaxial, I call it, you know, like a single line, they're on the same axis, more or less. And the closer the objects are together, the ropes fan out. That's the mechanism of gravity. When we talk about magnetism, what we have is first electricity, because we need to know what electricity is. Currently, the model presented by quantum mechanics, the one we're all taught in high school, maybe uh, uh, university level, what they show is, is that we have an atom, and we have this bead known as the electron you know the electron bead goes from atom to atom both the atom and the bead in other words the nucleus and the bead are uh, discrete entities and so the question is what compels the bead to move from atom to atom and we're saying it's very simple there's nothing moving there's no bead that's moving from atom to atom what you have is a ball Okay, and think about a, uh, um, a star, right? Uh, all these uh, lines coming out of the center and that's encapsulated by a uh, membrane, sheath, whatever you wanna call it, shell. And that is our atom. We're saying that the atom really pumps back and forth doing its quantum jump. By doing so, it torques the rope. Now, what happens? Electricity is all these atoms merged. Really, it's at the molecular level, but it's easier to explain it with hydrogen atoms, which everyone more or less can relate to. You have a hydrogen atom tied to another hydrogen atom to another one. They're blended, they're torqued, they're uh, merged into each other. The shells, the electron shells are merged to each other. 
So what happens? The whole, a whole series of atoms are turning in place. They're uh, spinning in situ, okay? That's electricity. By doing so, they send the uh, uh, threads to go around themselves. So you have these threads that come out of that mechanism because of the great speed, they twirl around and these threads are gonna form the magnetic field. So we have all these gazillions of threads. That's what forms the walls. You know, the walls of threads form the magnetic field that twirls 90 degrees to uh, the direction of current flow, meaning there is no flow, there is no current flow. What we have is torsion in situ torsion, right? So these things are turning around at great speeds, swinging the threads around, forming the magnetic field. And those are the two mechanisms. One has to do with magnetism and electricity, so-called electromagnetism. The other one has to do with gravity, which is a totally different uh, mechanism than the one for magnetism, electricity and magnetism. So yeah, this is how Mother Nature, Father Universe work. Uh, we have to work with what they give us. Uh, it's not like I'm inventing anything out of the ordinary. Everybody knows that what they've tried to do in the last, I don't know, at least 50 years is the grand unified theory or the toe, the theory of everything, which is merge electromagnetism with gravity. And what I'm saying is, you have a merge through the rope mechanism because with that same rope, you can produce electricity and magnetism on the one hand, electromagnetism, and on the other, gravity on the other through a different type of magnetism. All I can tell you is that's the way the universe works. <laughs> I didn't I didn't create the universe. I could only try to uh, explain with the rope model how we do one and how we do the other. There are two mechanisms. And I think uh, at least the mathematical physicists will agree with me that there are two magnet, two mechanisms out there. One is gravity and the other one is electromagnetism. Okay. Yeah. So that, I mean, it seems like there could be a deeper theory that accounts for why there's these two different forces, but that's not part of, you're, you're not trying to explain that, which is fine. Um, but let, let me let me give you uh, another issue on that. Uh, I've been talking lately about uh, ether in my uh, talks, at least for a month. And we have to understand the word ether. First of all, if you look up ether, like if you do a Google search on images, you will not find what the ether is. What you'll find is a bunch of lines, little dots they show with arrows uh, going through the earth, which is what the notion they had in the 19th century, when uh, when they did some experiments trying to prove that the ether did exist or did not exist, they were trying to figure out whether it did or not. And so, if you ask any etherist, "What is the ether?" Please illustrate it for me. I want to know what it is. Not a single etherist will be able to do that. And what they've always really had in the back of their minds, all the way since the days of the Greeks and even before that, because some of these ideas apparently came from the East. And what you'll find is the ether has always been what I call a bunch of particles. That's the definition <laughs> of ether, bunch of particles. They imagine it is all these particles that form like a background and filled all of space. So they had, they said, what is the, what is a wave? You know, like when uh, uh, they came up with a wave nature of light, what is a wave? Well, they say it's the vibration of the ether. It's a, you know, some kind of uh, ocean wave uh, the ocean being this ether. That's the idea they had in the back of their minds. Some of them saw the ether as static and the earth moving through this sand box. Others saw it as a fluid ocean where, you know, the, the ether was moving and uh, the earth was moving through this ocean, this moving ether. Well, according to uh, some of the experiments they ran out there, they said, well, the ether doesn't exist but they've never gotten rid of the ether. In quantum mechanics, it's known as the false vacuum, uh, virtual particles. You have uh, Laughlin, a uh, uh, Nobel Prize winner, and he says, uh, we don't call it the ether because it's taboo. <laughs> so the concept is the same. They have this world of particles that come in from the void and that filled space. And they call it, they, they don't call it the ether because it's uh, an overused word, you know, it's been dead for a hundred years, but it's the same concept. They've always thought that 
space is filled with all these particles as, as a backdrop and that light and all the uh, things that happen on stage happen in, in, in with this background uh, serving as the foundation for it. Okay, so this is the problem. The problem is they never got rid, rid of the ether because they've always conceptualized the universe as being filled with particles. Space-time itself, what is space-time? Well, if you look at Stephen Hawking, he'll tell you what space-time is. It's a bunch of events. What's an event? It's a point in space-time. In other words, they get a point and they say, something happened at that point. We have the coordinates, blah, blah, blah. And something happened at that point. And the summation of all these points, of all these happenings, that forms space-time. So, so they all think in terms of a sandbox, if you will, or uh, an ocean that's out there. And we're saying, no, there is no ocean. What you have is empty space, meaning we don't even need to use the word empty, just space, meaning space is that which has no shape. And within that, we have this single thread that makes up all the matter. And uh, some people say, well, that's the ether. No, it's a totally different concept because we're not talking about discrete particles. And so the ether really is a bunch of discrete particles. And uh, anyone who wants to refute that, no problem. I have no problem. Illustrate the ether for me. That's that's my only issue. Illustrate. Yeah, uh, so one 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 other point, I guess, is so one of the things I like about the things that you say is that it draws attention to the fact that you know we we don't have a deep, satisfying account of things like gravity and magnetism, and that draws attention to the fact that we don't, there's, there's something about matter which is mysterious, right? We can describe what it does in detail, but in, in terms of explaining why it does that, there's kind of a hole there, right? And I think you're drawing attention to the hole and saying science should be about trying to find out what goes in that hole, right? Um, and yeah, I think the, it, the issue, Jason, there is that mathematical physicists, as uh, first Feynman said, uh, Richard Feynman, Nobel Prize, 1965, I think, uh, he said the following. He says, the physicists, the mathematical physicists, they've given up on explanations. Uh, they don't do that anymore because they have no way of explaining. And I'm saying the only reason they cannot explain, they never identified the invisible, intangible mediators that Mother Nature, Father Universe, whoever, uses to do its uh, daily work. So if you're talking about, you know, uh, a spoon, right? Why does a spoon fall to the floor? I want to know just why it falls. Why does it fall to the ceiling? And they cannot explain the mechanism. They'll talk to you about mass. They'll talk to you about energy, force, time. I want to know the mechanism. I want to know how a car runs. You don't tell me about force and uh, energy. You tell me how the gas went to the carburetor. That's the type of explanation I'm looking for this. I'm saying, why? What causes this to fall to the floor? And uh, you, uh, I think I talked about it a little bit last time. Uh, you have uh, this um, professor. His name is Richard Muller from Berkeley University. And he says, every atom on Earth is pulling on every atom of you. You are also pulling, pulling on it. How do you pull unless you have an elongated object between the two atoms? And I'm saying what's between two atoms is this, you know, a twined pair of threads. Now you can talk about pulling. You can't pull with particles. I can't throw rocks at you and pull on you, okay? I can tie a rope to you and pull on you. That we can all understand, but I cannot throw rocks and pull you. And so you can't do pull with discrete particles, even though they're telling you that every atom on earth is pulling on every atom of you. And so, so they yeah, have I a like contradiction. The contradiction is that they never identified the physical entities that are invisible, intangible out there in nature. That's the issue. So, so right. So that makes, that so makes, Check it out, guys. <laughs> so that makes it makes sense to me to want that deep that explanation of why yeah. the spoon falls, and and I think like this is something that Philip Goff and other panpsychists point out that we don't know enough about why matter does what it does to rule out things like panpsychism. Set that aside. We don't know because we haven't identified the invisible 
intangible objects that are in this region. So, you know, we think there's nothing question. here. There is something here that we cannot see or touch. So we cannot yes. discover this through experiments. We cannot use eyes and hands. Yeah, and people have not, trouble. you know, mathematical physics says we need to measure. No, there, there's nothing to measure here. This is something you put your feet on your desk in your office with a beer in your hand and you visualize, you try to think. That's the way it works. This is not okay, something so you're going to resolve in the lab or in the field. So here's my issue, which is about the intuitiveness of your picture, which is, okay, so I know what it is to pull on a rope and see the object it's attached to move before me, move, move towards me. Um, but I can see the rope and I can't, if I get another rope, I can't pass the new rope through the old rope. Like if I get them next to each other, I can't pass them through each other. So I can see them. They don't move through each other. But your ropes, I can't see them. And they do move through each other. So I can understand how some, a rope that I can see and touch. And, you know, I can understand how that can, when it's attached between myself and a different object, can get the further object to move. But with your ropes that are invisible, and can pass through each other, I'm not sure that I should transfer my understanding of macro scale ropes to these micro scale ropes. Okay, precisely uh, because they behave differently. They don't reflect, they don't, they're not visible and they can pass through each other. Uh, keep in mind, uh, Jason, this is the issue. The issue is that the rope is not attached to an yes. atom, okay? okay? The rope itself forms part of the mm -hmm. atom to which it is attached, it's in contact with, whatever you want to call it. In other words, the rope is going to make, one of the threads of the rope is going to make up the center, go through the center of the atom and form the proton. The other uh, thread is going to go around and form the electron shell. So it's not like it's attached. It's like it's a continuous... <laughs> Uh, there's a single entity in the, United, in the entire universe, which is a single thread, okay? And so when you have, uh, when you're saying uh, that how does a rope pull on another atom, it really doesn't pull. There is no pulling. What you have is tension. There, the rope is always under tension, and that tension is a fixed amount, which is uh, uh, determined by the velocity of light. The velocity of light is 300,000 kilometers per second. And what we're saying, that's a measure of the tension on every rope in the universe. In other words, every rope is under tension. So the rope does not, um, the rope does not stretch or do anything of that nature. What it does is either talk at a, torque at a higher frequency, meaning the links are shorter or longer, right? That's all it does. Uh, if, it, if it's stimulated at a higher frequency, the, uh, the threads of a rope or uh, the links of the rope are going to be smaller, shorter, right? And otherwise they're longer. So if they're at a given uh, range, it's within the visible range. Uh, the atom is within a visible range. Otherwise it's not. But what's the issue? The issue is there's no pulling, okay? What we're saying is as one object full of atoms is... Uh, approaching another atom, which is full of atoms, uh, and every atom of that object is attached to the other one. As they come closer, the uh, closer they are, the faster they go, because more threads are wide, uh, more ropes are becoming um, uh, fanned out. Okay, so that's the mechanism. But the question is, you know, if something goes right through it, it it's it's no problem for because you're not cutting into the rope. The, uh, the, the, again, Mother Nature has fooled us, I believe, because of this tangibility issue. We, we're all concerned about tangibility. We're saying, how come I cannot see what is pulling on this spoon? And I'm saying, Mother Nature made it such that we cannot see or touch what's here, but we, we realize that this somehow is pulled to the center of the earth. And the question is, what's pulling on every atom here? Why isn't it pulled upwards towards the ceiling? Well, very clearly, because there are more atoms in the center of the earth than in, in my house. Okay, so that's the issue. But the question is, why is it pulled? And uh, Richard Muller has told you that every atom of this spoon is tied, 
is is being pulled, right? That's what he says. It's being pulled by every atom of the earth. Please explain to me in, in physical terms why, why this would be pulled unless every atom here is connected, physically connected to every atom on earth. You know, we have to answer that question. I'm saying that's the answer to that. Now we talk about tangibility. Why can't I touch it? Why can ropes go through each other? That's a separate issue. That's an issue of assumptions. Okay, we have to try to make an assumption of the properties that, that a rope has. And that's not easy because uh, let me tell you, we're always thinking in terms of macro world and we say, hey, you know, I can't go through the wall. Yeah, you can't, but the rope can go through a rope. And we say, oh, hold it, an object can go through another object. So we have to get to the definition of what an object is, which no one defined in the last 10,000 years. And I'm saying an object is not that which you can touch or see. An object is that which has shape. That's a totally different definition that destroys all religions because suddenly, you know, you, you can't say, well, uh, is God an object? Well, if you can draw God, if God has shape, you should be able to draw him. Then, you know, you can at least uh, present God as an object and whether he exists or not, then it's a question of location. But, uh, you know, you need to have objects to do physics. And right now they're doing, they're doing physics without objects. They're doing it only with concepts. That's where the problem is. They have not identified the invisible intangible objects. And so, yeah, then after you identify them, like in the case of the rope, in the case of the thread, then comes the issue of what properties do they have? And that is a monster. And let me tell you, it's a monster because, <laughs> again, we're not used to some of these properties in our macro world. We're saying, hey, you know, uh, I can't go through the wall. Uh, my hand can't go through the table. Yeah, but uh, Mother Nature's universe obviously works a little differently. The quantum mechanics at least blesses that, right? Because this always falls to the floor. And hopefully there is a physical object that is mediating this transaction, that every atom here is connected to every atom of the Earth. How else are you going to do it unless you put some elongated objects here? That's yeah. That's, yeah, that's, a, that's a good point to close off on because um, and like I know a lot of people are going to be like, oh, I want things to be empirically tested. But as you explain, not everything in physics can be empirically tested, especially if you're talking about things in the micro level of the universe. And, you know, the ropes are going to be smaller than atoms, so that's not going to be possible to really see anyway. But, you know, but you can come back with bills, just say, you know, like you don't need to see something to figure out what best explains the facts. And like, I think. Imagine. Of, visualize yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's like out of all the theories I've heard, I think yours best explains the facts. Because like you point out, like you can't explain pool with particles. Like how come you have particles going in this direction and the objects, instead of going in the predicted this direction, it's going down. So particles you throw out, you can't use a force because, well, like what's a force? Is it nothing? Nothing's pulling this down? Well, that doesn't make sense. An effect demands a cause. You, you need a something. So then you go. You cannot to, well, can't explain with discrete particles. Yeah, it can't be particles of force. So then it's like you then it's like that you explain pull with a rope. And so like after you formalize that and just you know explain you know how come the ropes don't tangle and stuff, and you talk about like your aggregation model, like in, you know, and like how they all the ropes when they come to get what like when the object comes closer to the ground, gravity works more efficiently because of uh, all the ropes, you know, uh, their individuality okay, becomes more apparent. Yeah, you can simulate that uh, very easily. Uh, in fact, I have a little stick in which I tied several um, strings to it. The farther away you go, you can see they all come together. And the closer you get to the stick, you know, they all get wide. And so it's like every string is pulling separately or acting separately. They're not really pulling, but, you know, you can see that they widen. They, they all open up. They're not on the same axis. And that's the acceleration of gravity. Right yeah, and, and like going on with that, it's like, you know, your theory, you know, your rope theory best explains the facts. Like, you know, it's the closest thing to a natural explanation that makes sense as to like, you know, why objects go to or towards the ground and like how magnets attract. So you can just suffice with, hey, at least my explanations be better explain the facts, even if we can't like empirically test them because, you know, we can't. We're not going to be able to see at the micro level <laughs> like that. So, you know, that, that's yeah, good you enough can't, for me. You can't go you know? to the lab or to the field to test something which is invisible, intangible. Uh, you can't use <laughs> eyes and you cannot use hands. 
Gotcha. No uh, testing will elucidate the invisible uh, mediators that Mother Nature has. Yep. All righty. Well, thanks again, Bill, for another fabulous discussion. And yeah, everyone check out, uh, he has his own um, YouTube channel. Uh, one of them's Bill Gate or B. Gatey, and the other one's YouStupidRelativist.com. He's got uh, a lot of videos that go into depth on uh, his view of physics. And if you want a, like, a better rundown of his rope hypothesis, just type in on the search on his uh, YouTube channel. You can just put in like rope hypothesis. And he has like a couple of videos that go into more depth into the rope well, hypothesis. The book, the book is for free, by the way. Uh, there's a free downloadable pdf oh, downloadable edition, which yeah. gives you an introduction to the rope model and the main points are there so people can look at that it's a free book you know i've uh, put it in my they can see it in the uh, uh youtube channel there just uh, look it up and you'll find the in the description of any video you'll find the book is for free they can download it and get acquainted with the main points of the rope model awesome all righty. Well, thanks everyone for coming in. And then in a couple of minutes, I'll have this downloaded on YouTube and I'll share the link with you both and you can share it on your website with on, and I'll put on your YouTube bill and share it with friends and family and everyone can know about, you know, how this interesting universe works. All righty. Thanks a lot, guys. And have Thank a good day. Folks.